you very much. Can, can you hear me? No? So let's get this mic real quick. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Good. That's my favorite quote from Stephen Hawking. <laughs> Thank you for that uh, too effusive introduction. <laughs> You're very kind. It is such a great honor to be the, the inaugural lecturer uh, for the C.B. Vishveshvara lecture series, for Vishu's lecture series. Vishu is I, as a close personal friend, called him. I will say just a little bit about his work about a third of the way into the lecture. But let me begin. 1.3 billion years ago, in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> and I remind you, 1.3 billion years ago is when the multicelled life was just forming on Earth and spreading across the Earth. And it was then that these two black holes, depicted here from a computer simulation done by the SXS collaboration, circled around and around each other, spiraling together as they em gradually emitted gravitational waves. The uh, two black holes came together in a wild cataclysmic uh, merger, collision, that emitted so much energy that it was equivalent to uh, taking three suns and completely annihilating them and turning them into gravitational waves. And that gravitational radiation came off so quickly in a tenth of a second that the power output, the energy per unit time, was 50 times larger than the total power output of all the stars in the universe put together. 50 universe luminosities from one collision of two black holes, but only for a br very brief period of time, a tenth of a second. The gravitational wave burst traveled outward uh, from the galaxy in which those two black holes lived into intergalactic space. They traveled across the great reaches of intergalactic space, and 50,000 years ago, when our ancestors were sharing the Earth with the Neanderthals, think of that. That's when these gal this burst of gravitational waves reached our own Milky Way galaxy. They then traveled for 50,000 years until they reached the Earth coming upward from the south. They entered the Earth at the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula. They traveled through the Earth unscathed by all the matter they were passing through, emerged first at the LIGO gravitational wave detector in Livingston, Louisiana, and seven milliseconds later, at the LIGO gravitational wave detector in Hanford, Washington. The signals picked up by the gravitational wave detectors were analyzed with great care by a team of a thousand people uh, that included contributors from all around the world, including the Indigo group here in India. And after a careful analysis uh, over this period of uh, several months, the team wrote a paper and published it announcing the discovery of gravitational waves, and it made headlines throughout the world from the Times of India to the New York Times. Uh, had every major newspaper and uh, most of the minor newspapers in the, new, in the uh, world, this was the headline on that day of the announcement on February 12 of 2016. How did we get here? I'm going to give you my own parochial point of view if uh, a lead LIGO experimenter were discussing this, you would get a different point of view. Uh, and maybe you've heard uh, David Reitze or some other lead experimenter discuss it, uh, but you'll get uh, a theorist viewpoint from me. It begins, of course, with Albert Einstein in 1915 when he formulated his general theory of relativity and then about six months later in 1916 predicted the existence of gravitational waves. And Einstein told us that what a gravitational wave is, is it's a stretching and squeezing of space in the pattern that I show here. If you just take a large number of particles, put them out in space so we don't have to worry about the, the complication of the Earth's gravity, and then watch them as the gravitational wave goes by, they are markers for space as space stretches and squeezes. And the pattern of stretching and squeezing is like this, the wave is propagating into the screen, then 
they stretch and squeeze in the plane perpendicular to that propagation direction, that is the plane of the screen, stretching, say, horizontally, squeezing vertically, at the next half cycle of oscillation, stretching vertically, squeezing horizontally. This is radically different from electromagnetic waves, uh, which uh, instead are oscillating electric and magnetic forces, so completely different kinds of phenomena, and I will return to that. In the Einstein, in his pioneering paper, said, in effect, that these waves, for any conceivable source of, uh, that we can imagine in the universe, will be so weak that humans will probably never, ever detect them. He was wrong. Einstein was occasionally wrong. He was not always right. But of course, he didn't know about black holes and neutron stars. He didn't know about lasers and computers. He didn't know the technology that would be developed in the subsequent uh, century, nor the new kinds of sources of gravitational waves that were conceived in that time. It was Joseph Weber who, with the benefit of these, this new knowledge, had the first, was the first person to have the courage to search for gravitational waves. He was a professor at the University of Maryland. He influenced me greatly. I spent a summer in the French Alps uh, at a physics summer school in Les Uches, France, near Chamonix. Uh, Joe lectured there, and he and I went walking a number of times in the French Alps and I became enamored of the idea of gravitational waves from talking with him. The University of Maryland was a very special time then in the 1960s. Joe Weber was building the first, world's first gravitational wave detectors. Charles Misner created a theory group at the University of Maryland beginning around, must have been around 1964, I think, or 65. And in that theory group, a major player in the late 1960s was Vishu, C.B. Vishveshvara. And the thing that I remember most about his work, you heard much about his work uh, uh, from Bala Iyer, but the thing that I remember most was a particular numerical experiment he did with a computer, and this is the early days of computers, and it was a brilliant experiment, in which he said, I'm going to take a black hole, and I'm going to, on a computer, send a pulse of gravitational waves inward, actually a pulse that's coming in from all directions, with what we call a quadrupolar angular distribution, uh, which is the kind of angular distribution you might expect that this black hole would emit if it emitted gravitational waves. We send in a Gauss, what we call a Gaussian pulse, narrow so it was smaller than the size of the hole. And what he got out, and this is from the paper that he published in Nature, in, uh, from the, this calculation, is what you see on the right there. Uh, it was a pulse that, uh, uh, began, so the beginning is to the right. This is what the pulse looked like as it traveled outward. So there's a great big pulse that somewhat, the initial piece somewhat resembles the incoming wave, except it's upside down. But, uh, uh, and then it oscillated, and, uh, and it oscillated up and down and died out very quickly. What the, this pulse had done was it had excited what we today call the quasi-normal mode of the black hole, the, the dominant quasi-normal mode. What Vishu did hereby was he demonstrated for the first time that black holes are dynamical objects. They really can pulsate. When they pulsate, they will emit gravitational waves. And he excited these pulsations in this computer simulation. A brilliant, brilliant piece of work that uh, had then a big impact on us in showing us that black holes are dynamical objects. Richard Isaacson was also a uh, student in Charlie Misner's group at Maryland. A uh, compatriot of Vishu, uh, working on his work at about the same time as Vishu was, 68. And Richard Isaacson solved a major problem that had besieged relativity for decades. He showed in an unequivocal way that gravitational waves carry energy, and he showed how they carry energy, the details of it, and showed that energy is conserved in the sense that if you have a black hole, and it uh, vibrates and emits gravitational waves, the energy in the gravitational waves uh, corresponds through Einstein's E equals mc squared to a reduction in the mass of the black hole. You might ask, how do you measure the mass of a black hole? The same way as we measure the mass of the sun. You put a planet in orbit around it and apply Kepler's laws to the orbit of the planet. And that gives you the mass. And we showed that uh, then that the mass of the black hole went down 
uh, the same amount as the mass was put into the gravitational wave. And so this was a real tour de force, another tour de force. And I'm going to return to Richard Isaacs, and he plays a big role in LIGO later on. At the same time, I built my own theory group at Caltech beginning in 1966. We were working on similar kinds of problems, perhaps not with as spectacular a result as uh, Vichu's uh, discovering the pulsations of black holes. But what we did focus on uh, toward the early 1970s was developing a vision, my students and I, in consultation with uh, our colleagues at the University of Maryland and elsewhere, a vision for the future of gravitational wave astronomy. And that vision uh, was based on a recognition of the tremendous differences there are between uh, the electromagnetic wave that astronomers have used throughout the past history as their primary tool for studying the universe and gravitational waves. So beginning on the left, electromagnetic waves are oscillations of the electric and magnetic field that propagate through space as time passes. Gravitational waves are oscillations in the very fabric of space and time itself. That is, stretching and squeezing of space is the principal effect in a gravitational wave, though there are other effects as well. So radically different physical processes. Electromagnetic waves are the incoherent, almost always in astronomy, not absolutely always, an incoherent superposition of emission from individual particles, atoms, and molecules, whereas gravitational waves are emitted coherently by the boat motion of matter and mass and energy. I, that matter should really read mass and energy, because in a black hole, there's no matter, but black holes emit gravitational waves through oscillating energy. Uh, so the emission processes uh, uh, are very, very different. And electromagnetic waves are all too easily absorbed and scattered by matter as they travel from their source to us, whereas my example of the first gravitational wave that it was detected by LIGO indicates that gravitational waves are in fact never significantly absorbed or scattered by matter. And so gravitational waves are the ideal tool for exploring things in the universe that are hidden electromagnetically. Because of these enormous differences, it became, it would seem very clear to me uh, in 1972 and to my compatriots that many sources of gravitational waves would not be seen electromagnetically, and that was true of the first gravitational wave burst that was seen. No electromagnetic emission at all was seen, only gravitational waves from these colliding black holes. And surprises are likely, big surprises are likely, since the, uh, because of these huge differences in the two types of radiation. That convinced me that if experimenters could really detect gravitational waves, those waves would likely create a revolution in our understanding of the universe. And so I wanted to be part of it, if I could be, if they could pull this off. Now, by 1972, there was beginning to be evidence that Joseph Weber, who thought he had seen gravitational waves, was not doing so. But in 1972, Ray Weiss at MIT uh, wrote a technical paper describing a new kind of gravitational wave detector, the kind that we use in LIGO. Uh, and in that paper, he identified all the major noise sources that these interferometers, as we call them, gravity wave interferometers, that they would have to deal with uh, uh, in order to be successful. And he uh, figured out ways to deal with each of these noise sources. And he computed what the resulting sensitivity would be. He compared the sensitivity with the strength of the gravitational waves that I and my colleagues were predicting and concluded that if you built these gravitational wave detectors a few kilometers in size, you had a real possibility to discover the gravitational waves. Now, I heard about this. I had not read his technical paper. He didn't publish it in a regular journal. He just put it in an internal report series at MIT, so it took me a little while to get a copy of the paper. Uh, but, uh, the, and by the way, the reason he did that was because Ray thought that it was not reasonable to publish a paper on an experiment until you had completed the experiment. So he wasn't going to publish this until he had detected gravitational waves. Of course, that took 50 more years, 45 more years. But, uh, so, uh, but, when, I, uh, but wh when I heard about this, and I was in the middle of writing a textbook with Charlie Misner and John Wheeler called Gravitation, I thought, Ray was crazy. I didn't think it was possible at all. And so I wrote the sentence in this textbook. 
which is a very mild sentence compared to what I believed, that this was not a promising approach. And then, and let me explain why it didn't seem promising to me. You take, I'm going to tell you how big the motions of the mirrors are that have to be measured if they're a few kilometers apart. You begin with one centimeter, you divide it by 100, you get the thickness of a human hair, 100 microns. Divide by 100 again, you get the wavelength of the light that is to be used in this gravitational wave detector. The idea that I should go back and say what the idea was, the idea was that you would have four mirrors that hang from overhead supports. And you're looking down here on the gravitational wave detector. When the gravitational wave detector comes by, it pushes the two bottom mirrors together while it's pushing the two top mirrors apart because it stretches in one direction and squeezes in the other direction. The next half cycle, it pushes those, the top ones together and pushes the bottom ones apart. And Ray had the idea to send a laser beam in, bounce the laser beam back and forth many times in these two arms, we call them, then recombine the laser light at a beam splitter. And the fact that the uh, travel distance in one arm has increased while that in the other arm has decreased means that the, at the interference point here, when the two beams come together toward a photodetector, the intensity of the light will rise and fall and rise and fall. So this is the technique using laser interferometry. And uh, so he was using light to make this measurement. And you begin with one centimeter, you divide by 100, you get the thickness of human hair, divide by 100 again, you get the wavelength of the light that he was proposing to use, you divide by 10,000, you get the diameter of an atom. Remember, the face of these mirrors is made of atoms. And now we have individual atoms in the mirrors, and we're at the level of the individual atoms. Divide by 100,000, you have the diameter of the nucleus of an atom. Divide by 1,000, you have the strength of the gravitational waves that we thought uh, Ray would have to detect. And I looked at those numbers, and I said, he's crazy. You're going to, he's going to do this at a level of about a, a trillionth the wavelength of the light that he's using, that's, that's outrageous. He's going to do this uh, at a level that is uh, 10 million times smaller, uh, or 10 or about 10 million times smaller uh, than the size of the atoms, these individual atoms of which the face of the mirror had made up. He's crazy. And so I said this was not promising. But then I studied his 1972 paper in great depth I discussed this with Ray and then with Vladimir Braginsky, a Russian colleague who uh, was a superb experimenter with whom, to whom I was very close. And I became convinced this had a possibility to succeed. In the meantime, Ro Ronald Drever at Glasgow University had invented some improvements on Ray's uh, idea, including having all the beam, light beams that bounce back and forth between the mirrors uh, be on top of each other, so the mirrors form what is called a Fabry-Perot cavity, which made this much simpler, but much harder to do in practice, but more versatile in the end. So it was a significant improvement that he was pushing. And so uh, I, when I, when I became convinced that this would likely succeed, I decided to convince my colleagues at Caltech that we should create a group at Caltech uh, doing, working on this kind of approach to detecting gravitational waves. And so we brought Ronald Drever to Caltech to lead that effort. Uh, and uh, a few years later, a couple of years later, uh, there was a workshop on sources of gravitational waves in Seattle, Washington. This is a photograph of the people at the workshop. It included Drever, it included Weiss, it uh, included me, uh, and uh, a number of other major players in the field at the time. And we look carefully as a group at all the sources of gravitational waves that these interferometers might try to detect. And one of the sources we were thinking about was supernovae, the implosion of a star to, uh, to form a neutron star and create an explosion as a result, a so-called supernova explosion. And I'm showing the uh, fractional change in separation of the mirrors uh, up. 10 to the minus uh, 20 was the absolutely strongest we might expect from a supernova, but it could be much, much weaker. Today we know it is much weaker. Uh, and uh, we had looked at, at the in-spiral and collision of black holes, of neutron stars, of a black hole neutron star system binary, 
and concluded that the strength of those waves ought to be inside that box. We looked at the uh, axis here to the left uh, and uh, concluded that the, in order to have success, we would have to get at least to a sensitivity of 10 to the minus 21 in the strain and the fractional change in arm length. And so we had t-shirts made up that said 10 to the minus 21 or bust. It was a, a, something or bust was a, a typical phraseology of that particular area that you're going to try your hardest and you will have failed if you don't make it. So 10 to the minus 21 or bust. When the first gravitational wave signal came in, its strength was right there in the star, 1.0 times 10 to the minus 21. So our goal beginning in 1978 was 10 to the minus 21 partly by luck and partly because uh, we more or less knew what we were doing. That's the strength of the strongest wave that uh, has been seen to date. Uh, at Caltech, we moved onward then uh, and under Reaver's aegis with Stan Whitcomb leading the effort in the laboratory, uh, built a 40 meter prototype for what became LIGO. At MIT, Ray Weiss uh, completed the construction of a smaller prototype and started working with it. And his group also did a feasibility study for interferometers, these detectors that had scales of 1,000 kilometers. And in 1984, we got together and formed the LIGO project, Caltech and MIT, with a troika, which is a Russian phrase from that era, of Dr Weiss, Drever, and Thorne running LIGO. Uh, and uh, under the aegis of Richard Isaacson, uh, whom I mentioned before, who was uh, a Misner's student, who had then gone to NSF after his spectacular theoretical work and had uh, become the program director for gravitational physics at NSF and uh, basically was our uh, leader and conscience in Washington and helped push this through Washington and gave us feedback and told us in no uncertain terms, you are a dysfunctional leadership, you're a failure, you've got to find a single director to take over. And he brought in a, uh, a uh, committee that looked at us for an entire week and came back with the same answer. This is so fantastic, NSF should do it. NSF should fund the construction of two of these interferometers at two different locations in the United States, but only if you have a single director to, uh, to uh, take over from this flaky set of three people who are not doing a very good job. And so that's what happened. We got Robbie Vogt, who had been the chief scientist, the first chief scientist at uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory that uh, leads all the space missions, uh, uh, interplanetary missions for NASA. He took over as director, and he led us in, construct, in writing a proposal to construct LIGO, construct the facilities first, and then a two-step strategy that we would build initial interferometers at the sensitivity that we might, if we were very lucky, see something, and then a second set of interferometers, advanced interferometers, at a better sensitivity where we'd very, very likely see a lot of gravitational waves. Why two steps? Because the advanced interferometers, which would have the ultimate success, were so complex that it was hopeless to build them first. The experimental team had to build a simpler in initial interferometers first and get the experience with them, see what can go wrong before doing the final design and construction of the advanced interferometers. We struggled from 1990 to 1992 to get funding, but ultimately got the funding from NSF and from Congress. And from then until now, the NSF and US National Science Foundation and Congress have backed us completely. It didn't matter who was in power in America, the Republicans or the Democrats. We had full backing all the way through. Even though the initial interferometers saw nothing, we had told Congress and NSF in advance, they probably won't see anything. So they were prepared for the possibility, the likelihood that we would have to build a second generation. Uh, and uh, so with that backing, which is remarkable given the riskiness of the project, with an expenditure of a billion dollars and the construction of a team of a thousand scientists by Barry Barish, who took over the leadership as we moved toward construction uh, and led us through the construction. and designed the LIGO collaboration of a thousand scientists, expanded LIGO to include a thousand scientists and engineers from what is now about 90 institutions, this is out of date, and 18 nations, uh, this was 16 when I made the slide, this is rapidly changing. Uh, and uh, then he led us in constructing the initial interferometers and in their first gravitational wave search searches, 
Then he got stolen away from us by another high-energy physicist, and we had two successive uh, directors who led the project, Jay Marks and now David Reitze. And they led us in the final searches with the initial interferometers and the installation of the advanced interferometers, and now I'm up to 2015. But I want to pause and say it was not enough to build these gravitational wave detectors. More than that was necessary for success. Theory had to come along as well. We had to understand the shapes of the gravitational waves, so, uh, waves that is, uh, what is the pattern of oscillation, stretching and squeezing, that they do on these interferometers uh, in order to be able to search for the gravitational waves optimally and in order to be able to extract the information the waves carry. The uh, computation of the shapes of the waves is done in two steps. First is the in-spiral of the two black holes or neutron stars as they come together up until they're moving at about a third the speed of light relative to each other. Think of that, a third the speed of light, objects that uh, weigh more than the sun. Uh, and uh, these computations are done analytically with pencil and paper, tremendously complicated using what are called post-Newtonian techniques. And the leading people in the world on this were Thibaut d'Amour and Luc Blanchet in France and Bala Iyer here in India with the number of other people contributing. Then the gravitational waves from the final collision of the two black holes had to be done numerically on a computer and uh, so Ajith talked about that just a little bit, the, uh, the best of the computer codes. And there are several computer codes around the world that are now capable of this. It was for the SXS uh, collaboration at Caltech, Cornell, and it now includes the Albert Einstein Institute in Germany. It was also necessary to be able to take these theoretical wave shapes and feed them into data analysis algorithms and develop these algorithms and implement them for data analysis. And the uh, pioneer in this, the real intellectual giant in the early days, would, was Bernard Schutz at Cardiff. Uh, Sanjeev Dur uh, Durandar, who's at Pune at Ayuka, went uh, to Cardiff and was trained by uh, Bernard Schutz, came back, and uh, Ayuka, under his leadership, played a major role in developing these data analysis algorithms. So, right from the beginning, really, on the theory side, both the sources and the data analysis, India was playing a major role, which is why there were a number of Indians involved uh, uh, in the uh, actual detection and the uh, pu first publication of the discovery paper. September 14, 2015, our advanced LIGO detectors, the second generation, was just preparing to begin its first search. They were being brought into the form, into the physical state that was needed for the first search, being tweaked. And the search was supposed to begin two or three days later, and the first gravitational signal came in before the first search actually officially began. The uh, team and then the director of LIGO went in and he said, I hereby declare the first search has begun because we saw our first wave. The first signal that came in was so strong that you could see it in the raw data if you removed the very high frequency part and the very low frequency. You did a band pass filtering, uh, so you kept only things between 30 hertz, 30 oscillations per second and 300 oscillations per second. And this is what it looked like at Hanford, Livingston, Louisiana. That's what it looked like at Han uh, Hanford, Washington, essentially the same. And uh, when you cleaned the signal up, uh, it looked like the gray pattern in here and the red is the SXS theoretical uh, waveform that best matches it. Beautiful, beautiful match. And by then comparing uh, the simulation that best matches it, by looking at that simulation that best matches the uh, incoming data, it was possible then to infer that these were two t black holes, one 29 times heavier than the sun, the other 36 times heavier than the sun, a total of 65 solar masses. And the simulation then told us that after the black holes merged, collided and merged, you only had 62 solar masses. Three solar masses were con converted into uh, gravitational wave energy. And this also told us by comparing with the observations, comparing the amplitude of the waves with the observations, the distance to the source, 1.3 billion light years. By now, there have been reported, uh, I, I show here, I guess, two, four, five black hole mergers, the waveforms for five black hole mergers, uh, there are really six. The last one isn't on this, uh, on here. It's 
uh, getting to the point where there, there are now getting to be so many that you can't uh, really go in and update it to, with every discovery. So it's getting to be almost routine, except that the data are tremendously precious in what they're beginning to tell us about black holes and about the universe. And I show here the range of masses for, e the masses for each one, the distance from the Earth for each one. But there, uh, and the next issue is to identify where these things are on the sky. And I show here the uncertainty error boxes on the sky for where these various black hole mergers are. And these are huge error boxes, except for this last one, GW170814, this, this symbol here, this name, says that this came in in the year 2017 on August the 14th. And that signal, we have a very small error box by comparison. The reason is that we got a third gravitational wave detector uh, in uh, Pisa, Italy, the Virgo gravitational wave detector. That's a collaboration of France, Italy, the Netherlands, Poland, and Hungary. Uh, it's a collaboration that's about a tenth the size of the LIGO collaboration, sm much smaller. We're doing two detectors, and we uh, have a much more robust team uh, than they do. But they finally came online, they contributed, and it was crucial for them to contribute in order to narrow down the location on the sky, because we get the direction to the source primarily by when uh, pieces of the signal arrive at different locations on Earth. So for example, because the signal came in, or the first signal came up through the Earth from the South Pole, uh, it arrived at Livingston, Louisiana first, at Hanford, Washington second. Uh, there was a time delay between those two, and you knew that it came from the south because it arrived at Livingston, Louisiana first, Hanford second. Having three detectors on the surface of the Earth helps you then identify the direction of the source if the signal is coming in more or less in the plane of those three. But you need a fourth gravitational wave detector far out of that plane in order to be able to cover the entire sky and see where the source is coming from. And I'm going to return to that. Three days after this uh, last black hole merge that, that I talked about, another signal came in and it turned out to be due to two neutron stars spiraling together, colliding and merging. Now black holes are made from warped space and time. Neutron stars are made from nuclear matter. A neutron star has a size of about 20 kilometers across, has a mass typically of about one and a half times the mass of the sun. The density at the core of the neutron star is 10 times higher than the density of an atomic nucleus. And we don't understand matter at those densities very well. We will learn about that. We're beginning to learn about the properties of the matter from the gravitational wave observation. When neutron stars collide, because they are made of matter, you get electromagnetic waves. And so it turned out there was a burst of gamma rays seen on Earth, uh, well, seen by uh, gamma ray detectors in orbit or above the Earth, because they can't penetrate through the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, a burst of gamma rays came in 1.7 seconds after the gravitational wave said that the two, black two neutron stars collided. What was going on is the collision of the neutron stars created a nuclear fireball. Uh, the outer layers of the merged star went blown off in a huge fireball, and it took about 1.7 seconds for the fireball to expand enough that it was transparent enough for the gamma rays to get out. And then as it expanded further, it became transparent to lower and lower frequency elect electromagnetic waves. And so we saw successively X-rays, or I should say electromagnetic astro astronomers saw successively X-rays, ultraviolet light, optical light, infrared radiation, and radio waves. So a huge international collaboration participated in, watch, in looking at all of these electromagnetic waves along with the LIGO and Virgo, Virgo scientists who looked at the gravitational waves. In fact, this is the most studied object in terms of the number of sci astronomers that worked on studying it, the most stu studied phenomenon in the history of astronomy. Studied as a result of the trigger of the discovery of the gravitational waves. This represents the first step in what we call multi-messenger astronomy. We think of gravitational waves in the LIGO band as being a messenger. X-rays are a messenger. Uh, radio waves are a messenger. All these different kinds of messengers come in. Their messages, their data are combined to use, understand what's going on in a source. The source uh, 
it was two colliding neutron stars, and this had been hot, but given the name a kilonova, what would you would get from a, a two colliding neutron stars? And the simulations of a kilonovae of these kinds of collisions tell, tell us they predict that the heavy elements, the things like the precious metals, gold and platinum, are produced in such collisions. In fact, the simulations say that in this neutron star collision, there should have been 150 earth masses of gold produced. Just think, you take a, the earth, turn it all into gold, you have 150 of them, that's how much gold was presumably produced in the collision of these two uh, neutron stars. Uh, is that really what happened? Well, there are predictions that because the, uh, the atomic nuclei that are formed, these heavy nu atomic nuclei are initially formed nuclei that are quite unstable and then they decay through radioactivity and you get then a light curve, how the light rises and then falls from this uh, as a result of the uh, heating and then gradually dying out of the heat from the radioactivity, you get a prediction that agrees with what was observed. And so we're pretty sure that that really is what happened. Now, before uh, we had uh, the Virgo detector, you couldn't tell hardly at all where the source was on the sky. You needed three uh, detectors, but they could only tell you where the source is if it happened, the source happened to be more or less in the plane of the three detectors. I told you you needed a fourth detector to cover the entire sky. So with LIGO, Hanford, and Livingston, and the Virgo detector, these are the error boxes you would have for a neutron star merger uh, on the sky. And these error boxes are pretty bad in most of the locations on the sky. So we need a third detector, a fourth detector that is out of that plane of those first three. And that fourth detector is LIGO India uh, that is uh, being built by the Indigo collaboration uh, here in India. <laughs> so this LIGO India is absolutely crucial for multi-messenger astronomy. You just look at the error boxes, look at what happens when you go without LIGO India, and you bring LIGO India in. It's a huge reduction in the north-south uh, portion of the error boxes. And we will get a further reduction east-west, but east-west is already pretty darn narrow uh, by a detector called Kagra that is being built in Japan. And so uh, this is the future. By the uh, mid-2020s, we will have all these detectors operating. We will have quite small error boxes, which are crucial for telling the electromagnetic astronomers where to look for, uh, the, uh, for electromagnetic waves that accompany a gravitational wave burst. The uh, LIGO India uh, con con agreement between the United States National Science Foundation uh, and the relevant ministers, ministries here of the Indian government was signed on March 31st, 2016. Uh, and that's a picture of the signing ceremony with the director of NSF there on the right. Uh, and the Indian commitment to LIGO India is to construct and operate for 10 years an advanced LIGO observatory on Indian soil. And the ICTS here is playing a major role in the analysis of the sources of these gravitational waves that will be seen and in the data analysis. The American commitment is to provide the components of the de detectors, which have already been built and they're sitting in boxes waiting for the construction of the facilities to house those components here in India, uh, to uh, provide facility design and software, and then to have a close technological collaboration with the Indian experimenters, and for example, photonics, lasers, control systems, vacuum systems, and something I'm going to talk about in a few minutes called quantum non-demolition technology, which is a really remarkable thing. It's a, a new technology that's part of quantum information science that is built into, has to be built into LIGO India, because LIGO India will be operating in an era when it's absolutely essential for success. Let me now show you some photographs of uh, the LIGO detectors, the advanced LIGO detectors. This is a photograph from the air of the, uh, detector in uh, Hanford, Washington. You see the arms, the laser is beam is going back and forth down vacuum pipes that are inside a cover, a concrete cover that we put over the vacuum pipes. In the United States, you put it over to protect against bullets because we have a lot of, have a lot of people running around with guns and firing them. 
it also helps protect against the environment. But the main reason, and we had these debates about it, how thick a cover do you have to have? And we agreed it had to be thick enough to stop a bullet uh, in the 1980s when we were originally planning LIGO. Uh, inside, you see the size of a human being. And uh, it was Barry Barish, the director of LIGO, who really made LIGO happen, who put the baseball player there to show you the size of these instruments. So these are vacuum chambers that house the supports for the uh, mirrors that hang and swing under the action of the gravitational waves. And this is a mirror that looks like it's fixed, but in fact it's free swinging, but just by tiny amplitudes. The gravitational wave pushes them by this tiny fraction of, uh, the diameter of an atom. And so that is one of these 40 kilogram mirrors. These instruments, because you have to deal with noise sources, enormous number of noise sources, there's so many things can go wrong when you're trying to make such exquisitely tiny measurements. They are complicated. There are 100,000 data channels come out of each interferometer. Uh, and that, uh, uh, and most of them are monitoring what's going on inside the instrument. Uh, but some of them are monitoring the environment. And when you see a gravitational wave signal, you go in and you look at uh, many of these data channels to see was there anything going wrong inside the interferometer? Was it behaving properly in all respects? And this is absolutely crucial for knowing whether or not what you see is real. But that means that these instruments are so complex that they have their own personality. It's, it's rather like uh, the Frankenstein, who is, is actually the name of the builder of uh, the uh, person, of, of the entity that we call Frankenstein. It's like building Frankenstein and learning Frankenstein's uh, personality afterwards, that, uh, that he's a, a rather a dangerous character. So the experimenters build these instruments and they have to then learn the personality of the instrument because it's not working precisely the way they want it since it's too complex. And so we are now in a phase where the advanced LIGO instruments have been shut down and they're going to stay shut down for more than a year, perhaps a year and several months, while the experimenters poke and prod the, uh, in, these interferometers, learning their personalities coaxing the interferometers toward their design sensitivity, which should be reached about 2020. At the present time, these instruments are at about a third their design sensitivity, which means that uh, by the 2020, they should see roughly three times farther than they are today, which means seeing a volume three cubed or 27 times bigger. Now, when both instruments are working uh, properly, or all three now that Virgo is uh, in the network, uh, we see about one black hole collision per month. So at design sensitivity, we'll see a 27 times higher rate or about one a day. Think of that, one black hole collision per day. Uh, and so that is very exciting. But we have to face at design sensitivity a new piece of physics. It was Vladimir Braginsky, whom I talked about at the beginning of my lecture, who was a key advisor to me through this whole thing, and he developed some of the key te technologies for LIGO and transferred them from, from Russia uh, to Western Europe and the United States. And the Russian government had no idea that that was the direction of the technology transfer. But it was uh, Braginsky in 1968, he looked at this su uh, subject of uh, gravitational wave detection. He said, no matter how, what design you have for a gravitational wave detector, you're going to have, for success, you will likely have to monitor the motion of big masses, 40 kilogram masses in LIGO, at such an exquisite precision that these masses will behave according to the laws of quantum mechanics. Now let me explain that a little bit more. Quantum physics says that everything fluctuates at least a little bit. The smaller the mass of an object, the more it fluctuates. Electrons have very small masses. They fluctuate a lot. They fluctuate so much in where they are that if you have an electron inside an atom, you cannot ever predict where it is in the atom. All you can do is predict the probability that it's here or there or some other place because of these huge fluctuations that are about the size of the atom itself. Uh, the heavier an object, the smaller the fluctuations. And so we are dealing with 40 kilogram objects, but we're making measurements at a level 10 million times smaller than an atom. And that is such an exquisitely small level that that is right at the level, this is an advanced LIGO, of these vacuum fluctuations 
so-called vacuum fluctuations, the fluctuations in the position of the center of mass of these mirrors, and that in fact is what LIGO is designed to do, is measure the motion of the, of the center of mass under a gravitational wave. And so we have the issue that for the first time in LIGO, at design sensitivity, 2020, humans will see human-sized objects undergo quantum fluctuations. And that is really a remarkable landmark in technology. And, it, and then to go beyond uh, advanced LIGO, which we will be doing in LIGO India by the middle of uh, the, uh, the 2020s, you have to have quantum non-demolition technology, which means technology that enables you to get a gravitational wave signal through a fluctuating mass that's fluctuating by distances bigger than the gravitational signal moves them without having those fluctuations demolish the signal. And that looks impossible at first sight, but we have in LIGO developed the technology to do this, quantum non-demolition technology. So I will return to that very briefly in a moment. Um, or no, I guess I already uh, uh, said it. In LIGO India then is going to have to deal with this quantum non-demolition technology. And so uh, that is one of the pieces of technology that will be transferred to India as part of uh, the agreement uh, with uh, the National Science Foundation. There are a number of other sources for uh, advanced LIGO and design, design sensitivity that we think we're going to see the uh, gravitational waves from. Neutron stars, each 20 kilometers across, weighing the mass of the sun, one and a half times the mass of the sun. As they spin, if they have mountains on their surface, they will emit a continuous gravitational wave that just oscillates and oscillates and oscillates. These are the same objects as pulsars that emit per bursts of uh, electromagnetic waves. We expect to see gravitational waves from these spinning neutron stars. We expect to watch black holes tear neutron stars apart. We've already seen neutron stars collide. We hope to see the gravitational waves from the collapse of a star to uh, form a neutron star, and then a burst, a supernova outburst. So gravitational waves it will tell us the details of how supernovae are born. How does the implosion of the core of a star create a gigantic explosion? And there will be enormous surprises, and that's what I'm hoping for. And a large fraction of the work on data analysis these days in LIGO is uh, trying to develop data analysis algorithms to search for gravitational waves that we don't know what they are. Uh, to make these big discoveries of big surprises. Beyond advanced LIGO, if we are only limited by technology and not limited by money coming in from uh, the government uh, or from whatever sources of money we can find, if we're only limited by technology, in the early 2020s, uh, we had hoped to operate, expect to operate something called, called advanced LIGO plus, uh, and this is where LIGO India will come into play at, at that point. We're seeing 1.6 times farther than uh, advanced LIGO. So we are seeing black hole collisions a few times a day. By the late 2020s, a third generation of detectors called Voyager see two times farther than uh, LIGO A+. And uh, black hole collisions about once an hour. And by the 2030s, a de gravitational wave detector of a new generation or the, uh, a new kind of a configuration in Europe called the Einstein Telescope, and a LIGO-type interferometer with 40-kilometer arms instead of 4-kilometer arms is likely to be in operation. We'll see at least five times farther still, and we by then will see every black hole collision in the entire universe with masses below about 1,000 solar masses. So this is where we're going, and we'll be seeing lots of other things besides colliding black holes. Now, just as in electromagnetic astronomy, we have optical astronomy, radio astronomy, x-ray astronomy, and so forth, we think of these as different windows onto the universe. So in gravitational astronomy, we will have different windows. Uh, gravi LIGO operates uh, looking for gravitational waves that oscillate with periods of milliseconds, basically uh, 100 milliseconds uh, down to a tenth of a millisecond. So that's our frequency band. An analog of LIGO that consists of three spacecraft that track each other with laser beams in orbit around the sun uh, called uh, LISA, which is a European Space Agency mission, uh, should uh, be seeing by the early 2030s gravitational waves with periods of minutes to hours. Uh, radio astronomers look at uh, 
the uh, radio wave pulses from pulsars, spinning neutron stars, uh, at different locations on the sky. And if a gravitational wave comes by the Earth, it, uh, roughly speaking, it speeds up and slows down all our clocks on Earth, which means that all of these pulsars should appear to sp slow down and speed up because it's our clocks that are being affected by a gravitational wave here. This is called a pulsar timing array, and this technique is likely to succeed uh, within the next few years, seeing gravitational waves with periods of years to decades. And then a technique that I'll return to at the very end of my talk called the CMB polarization. We'll see gravitational waves. It's actually with periods of hundreds of millions to a billion years. So we have, of course, that's longer than a graduate student uh, lifetime. So you don't watch the oscillations. You look for a pattern on the sky that's produced by the gravitational waves, which I will return to as the last item in my talk, uh, which I am actually nearing now. So we will have then four different windows onto the universe with gravitational waves within the next 20 years. It's as though we had started optical astronomy, radio astronomy, X-ray astronomy, and gamma ray astronomy all over a period of, of 20 years, which is really quite remarkable. Among the physics, the things that we will do is we will explore black holes with exquisite detail. With LISA, for example, if you have a, well, let me back up. One of the things we want to do is map the geometry of space-time of a black hole. A black hole is made from warped space and time and not of matter. Uh, we can visualize this by taking an equatorial slice through the black hole. That's a two-dimensional plane that is not flat, it's warped. And so we can imagine embedding it in a flat three-dimensional space. And if you do that, it looks like this surface here, becoming flat far away where you get far away from the black hole. But it looks like a funnel, and you've all seen diagrams like this. With the horizon of the black hole down here at the bottom where it's black, it looks like a circle here, but it would be a flattened sphere if I restore the missing third dimension. I just have the two dimensions that I'm depicting with this embedded in a higher dimensional uh, space. It's the fifth dimension of interstellar. So those of you who have mastered all the physics of interstellar, this is the fifth dimension, looking in from the bulk. Anyway, so the uh, color coding shows the slowing of time near the black hole, where it's yellow time is flowing at 10% of the rate that it is far away, where it's black time is slowed to a halt. Uh, and so this is, and the arrows show the dragging of space into a whirling motion by the spin of the black hole a large angular velocity, meaning a large uh, air, white arrow near the horizon, much smaller farther away. So this is, depicts the warping of space and time around a black hole. We want to map this with exquisite accuracy, not just in the plane of the uh, equatorial plane, but everywhere around the black hole. And this will be done by LISA, these three spacecraft that are tracked by laser beams which will be studying giant black holes, math masses of millions of suns, just because of the wavelengths that LISA goes after. It's the wavelengths of giant black holes. So you have, we have a small black hole orbiting around a large black hole, gradually spiraling in. It turns out that the waves that are emitted by that small black hole encode a full map of the geometry of space and time around the big black hole that's being explored by the small black hole. And you can get some sense of this by looking at the orbit, if I just remove the warping of space in here and just look at the orbit as though space were flat, this is the orbit of the small hole around the big hole, and it's nothing like the orbits of the planets around the sun. Why? Because the big hole is dragging space into a whirling motion, and when the, uh, when the small hole gets close to the big black hole, it's whirled around by that whirling motion of space, and that's going on together with the ordinary elliptical motion but the warping of space is making the elliptical motion itself not be very elliptical. But the small hole explores a huge region of space around the big black hole and thereby samples it and builds a map that we can extract of the space-time geometry of the big black hole. What if the central body is not a black hole, it's something else such as the naked singularity, then as in this simulation of the particular uh, theoretical na naked singularity, the kind of thing that's at the center of a black hole uh, but uh, brought out into the open so that it's not hidden by the black hole horizon. The orbit is chaotic around this naked singularity. You get a radically different kind of a map. Uh, and so we have here in our disposal a tool for making exquisitely highly accurate maps 
of whatever kinds of central massive objects there are in the universe that small black holes orbit around. We also will uh, and are already are, are exploring the dynamics of curved space-time when two black holes collide. So this is a similar kind of a diagram of two black holes. This is a simulation of the first gravitational wave uh, source that was ever discovered. And we can watch the two black holes go around each other. And I'm going to put this in slow motion as they begin to collide and merge. This is a scene from the bulk, from the fifth dimension. And you see there's a giant splash like you would get if you had a storm at sea splashing on a big ship flashing way up high, and then it dies out. And it is that splash in the shape of space and the rate of flow of time that produced 50 universe luminosities in gravitational waves. And so we do the simulations. We begin to see in the simulations the storms in the shape of space and time that are produced by a black hole collision. We verify through the observed waveforms their agreement with what is predicted by these simulations. We verify that the storm is just as Einstein's laws predict. And we will, with Lisa, be making very, very accurate measurements of these storms. Uh, I'm going to conclude with a few words about the birth of the universe, because by the middle of this century, studying the birth of the universe is going to be, I think, the primary or the most interesting thing, aside from unexpected surprises, that is done with gravitational waves. First, the birth of the fundamental forces. Theory tells us that when the universe was younger than 10 to the minus 12 seconds, younger than a trillionth of a second, the electromagnetic force did not exist. There was not such a thing as an electric field or a magnetic field. There was something called the electroweak force. Uh, and Maxwell's equations didn't exist. They were not a relevant law of physics. But uh, at, as the universe cooled at an age of a, tr a trillionth of a second, then uh, this electric weak force came apart, and very likely inside bubbles, the new forces were created. So inside this bubble, there is a, such a thing as electromagnetism. Outside, there is not. And these bubbles then are predicted to expand at the speed of light, collide, and produce a burst of gravitational waves. And as the universe expands subsequently for the last 13 billion years, the wavelength of that burst of gravitational waves will be expanded until today, the gravitational waves are in Lisa's frequency band. And so I look forward to the day in the 2030s when we may be observing by Lisa the birth of the electromagnetic force, the birth of Maxwell's equations as laws of physics. And that is really quite remarkable. LIGO could see a similar so-called phase transition uh, when the universe was 10 to the minus 22 seconds old, we have no idea what was going on in the laws of physics at age 10 to the minus 22 seconds. But LIGO was looking for a stochastic background of gravitational waves that might have been produced at that time. Finally, gravitational waves from the very birth of the universe. We believe, as theorists, that the universe was uh, born in the so-called Planck era, when space and time and matter were all created sort of simultaneously in that Planck era. And that thereafter, the universe expanded in an inflationary uh, way extremely rapidly for a period of about 10 to the minus 33 or 10 to the minus 32 seconds. And then the expansion began to slow. But that inflationary expansion took whatever gravitational waves came off of the Planck era, and it expanded them, it amplified them, according to theory. So we wind up with a rich spectrum of gravitational waves that carries information about a mixture of whatever came off the Big Bang, the birth of the universe, and what inflation did to that to, to, to amplify it. Those gravitational waves went out through the universe in the era when matter was so dense that electromagnetic waves couldn't propagate. When the universe was 380,000 years old, the plasma began to recombine. And this is a fancy way of saying that suddenly electromagnetic waves could propagate. And these gravitational waves put a polarization pattern, a very peculiar polarization pattern, according to the theory, on the electromagnetic waves. These electromagnetic waves, called the CMB, or cosmic microwave background, then propagated to Earth with their polarization pattern, arrived at Earth 13.7 billion years later, and electromagnetic astronomers are looking at, they have seen this polarization pattern, 
but they have to separate it from background noise, which has not yet been uh, done successfully. And so uh, sometime within the next decade, I expect we will actually have an indirect observation of those gravitational waves from the Big Bang as amplified by inflation. Uh, and in the middle of this uh, century, in the, perhaps the 2050 time frame, a follow-on mission to LISA is likely to fly, which will directly observe these primordial gravitational waves with periods of between a few seconds and a minute. So we'll have observations with periods of around a few seconds to a minute, and observations with periods of 100 million years seen by a pattern of polarization on the sky. And we have, theorists have given a prediction as to what those waves should be, and I would be willing to make a pretty strong wager that the waves will not be what theorists think they're going to be. And that we then will have the mystery of understanding what really did come off the Big Bang. We will have observations of that. We will have uh, it can, can evolve with uh, information about inflation. And the Big Bang is governed by the laws of quantum gravity, and the holy grail of theoretical physics is to understand those laws, and this will be, I suspect, the perhaps the most important, the most valuable piece of observational data about the laws of quantum gravity that gave rise to the birth of the universe, controlled the birth of the universe, that will be being explored by 2050. So let me just wind up by saying that it was 400 years ago that Galileo created electromagnetic astronomy by building a small optical telescope and turning it on the sky, and discovering the four biggest moons of Jupiter, and then turning it on the moon, discovering the craters of our moon. Two years ago, LIGO started up, advanced LIGO, discovered gravitational waves from colliding black holes. Now, in those 400 years since Galileo, uh, we've learned so much about the universe. Our understanding of the universe is radically, radically different than the, in Galileo's days. All as a result of electromagnetic astronomy. I will let you speculate about where gravitational wave astronomy will take us in the next 400 years. Thank you. Thank you, Kip, uh, for uh, taking us through this, uh, this wonderful journey and giving us a, a glimpse of the future. Uh, I hope you'll be willing to take a couple of questions. Um, so before, uh, um, so if you have a question, I'm, I'm sure you have, a lot of you have uh, burning questions, but unfortunately, we can only take a couple of questions. Uh, before, so please uh, raise your hands if you would like to ask a question, and one of our volunteers would uh, uh, bring a mic with you. But uh, before we start, I would, uh, after this uh, proceedings, we would like you to, to disperse in an orderly manner. So I would, uh, may I request that people in the outside leave first to the gate towards the right, and people inside the foyer wait for a couple of minutes before, uh, before, uh, before uh, leaving the, the venue. So let me try to give uh, preference to younger people, like students, and uh, so let me, uh, Ajit. Yeah. Hello, Kip. Uh, it's been an honor to attend this function and the slide. And I would also like to be very precise. Yeah, please. Yeah. So, yeah, I'll get to the questions right away. I'm aware that you don't believe in the concept of God being behind the cosmic happenings. I'd like to know when your views on the ignoring the notion of personal God started to surface and how discoveries as these will challenge the dogmatic views that people still cling on to. So and to end with, and please share your best memories with Professor Hawking and Carl Sagan, and also Christopher <laughs> Nolan. <laughs> Is that one question or ten? <laughs> uh, so let me just say that uh, when I discovered the power of science for giving verifiable results and teaching us about the universe, the issue of whether God exists became irrelevant to me. Um, I should add that that's not the case of all great theoretical physicists uh, or observers. Alan Sandage, who is probably the greatest observational uh, cosmologist of the 20th century, is a very devout Catholic. 
a deep believer in God. Um, my uh, former student, Don Page, is a fundamentalist Christian. How he reconciles that with being one of the most creative uh, physicists and thinking about quantum gravity and the birth of the universe, I don't know. But he's a, he's a very devout fundamentalist Christian. And, and, and so on it, it goes. So uh, I, although I don't find the question of whether God exists very interesting, I have colleagues who are devout believers and who are great scientists. Uh, you just asked about my friend Stephen Hawking. He and I have, together with Linda Opes, written the treatment for the next movie that you will see perhaps in three years. Uh, you, ask if, you ask about Carl Sagan. It was Carl Sagan who set me up on a blind date with Linda Opes in 1980 that initiated Interstellar because it was Linda then became a great uh, movie producer and called me up in 2004 and said let's brainstorm for a movie uh, together and uh, by a few days later we'd given it the name Interstellar. So that's Carl and that's uh, Stephen uh, and a little bit of their impact on me in connection with Hollywood. So, okay. so while we, you know, movies are great, we would appreciate if you ask more physics questions. Uh, Good evening, sir. My question is regarding the interaction of gravitational wave with one of one gravitational wave with another gravitational wave. Do they superimpose? And if so, does the LIGO observatory understand it? And can it differentiate between them? So if you look at waves on water from two different sources, throw two pebbles into a very quiet pond. You watch them pass through each other. Uh, if the pebbles are far enough apart, so the waves are pretty weak when they reach each other, they pass each other, they superpose, but once they've passed through each other, uh, there's no trace of their interaction left. So they superpose and then pass through each other unscathed, unaffected. Gravitational waves are predicted to be the same, and by the time they reach Earth, they are very, very, very weak. And so uh, if we have, and Lisa will see a number of gravitational wave sources simultaneously. LIGO is not likely to see, uh, except for pulsars, to see uh, as, uh, simultaneously waves coming from different directions. Lisa will. It will be necessary to unfold the uh, signals from all these waves uh, that are coming in simultaneously. But they do superpose linearly, no uh, significant interaction. On the other hand, if they're strong, then they can interact. In the same way as uh, if you have a nonlinear crystal and you send a light of different wavelengths through, or even light of the same wavelength, it can interact with itself, or the different light beams can interact and do wonderful things like the frequency doubling by which uh, a laser pointer makes green light beginning with infrared light through these nonlinear processes. Uh, but you need to be able to hold some strong waves together long enough for them to interact and do things like frequency double or uh, whatever they're going to do. And there is one place we think where this may happen, and this is a fairly recent technical paper uh, by Guan Yang and Aaron Zimmerman, who are students of my successor at Caltech, uh, Yan Bei Chen. Uh, uh, together with Louis Lehner, who's a great uh, nu numerical relativist. And what they found through theoretical calculations is that if you, have, if you have two black holes that collide and merge and they make a final black hole that's very f spinning very, very fast, then according to theory, the shape of the space around that final black hole will have a very long neck that goes down until you reach the horizon. And you can trap gravitational waves inside that neck for quite a while and they can interact. And what these, these uh, people found in a paper that was published a couple of years ago is that interaction creates an analog of turbulence, uh, like the turbulence in the air that you meet on an airplane, except ordinary turbulence in a fluid, you have energy that cascades from very large wavelength uh, eddies, very large eddies to smaller eddies to smaller eddies. But this is what's called two-dimensional turbulence, which goes in the opposite direction. And so you have uh, waves uh, that may be formed in this black hole collision trapped in the uh, throat of this uh, black, big black hole. They interact, and energy then cascades 
from uh, small uh, wavelengths or small eddies to large ones, which is really quite peculiar. This is, this is really an example of things that we're learning about the nonlinear interactions of, uh, of warp space time with itself that uh, I would hope that we will actually see uh, in LIGO, but we have to find a black hole collision that leaves the final black hole spinning very, very rapidly in order to have a hope to see that. That's a long answer. I think it's a very interesting question because of the interesting physics involved. Sir, uh, good evening, sir. Uh, I have a question. Like you were about, you were on the verge of discovering something first of its kind, gravitational waves. So your your instruments need to be sensitive to gravitational waves. What did you use to calibrate your instrument so that you know if it detects it to be the right uh, gravitational wave? So what? Did, how did you calibrate, calibrate so like it's a very good question. One way you could imagine calibrating it is by applying a gravi an oscillating gravitational force. Uh, but an equally good way, or essentially equally good, is to just move the mirrors back and forth in some other manner. Because we know the gravitational waves just move the mirrors back and forth. And so what is done is to apply an electromagnetic force to the mirrors to push them back and forth by a very tiny amount, an amount that's the size of the motions that the gravitational wave would produce, but at some precise frequency or at several different precise frequencies. Uh, and so they're moving back and forth in just the way they would under the action of a gravitational wave. And then that causes uh, the laser beam to measure a signal and that goes through the entire system and you see the output. And you know by how much the mirrors are moving because you understand Maxwell's equations, you understand electromagnetism, and, uh, uh, and you know how big the output signal is. So this, in fact, is how, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, these instruments are calibrated. You have, basically, at all times, spectral lines. At some narrow frequency, the mirrors are oscillating back and forth, and uh, the signal is being monitored. And so you hope that you don't get a gravitational wave at precisely that frequency. You've lost a little tiny bit of, uh, of gravity wave signal in that tiny frequency band. That's the price that you pay for calibration. Uh, good evening, sir. First yeah. of all, thank you so much for the wonderful lecture. My question is, um, when you say that the gravitational uh, waves are being detected by LIGO and Virgo, uh, so is the instruments kept on always, or there are mathematical models which predict the merger of black holes. And if there are such mathematical models, they tend to give false alarms. What kind of techniques do you use to you know, reduce those false alarms and then uh, increase the probability, uh, you know, the, uh, the exact time when the actual black holes can be detected? So we don't know in advance when two black holes are going to merge because we can't see uh, any electromagnetic emission from them. We can't see gravitational wave emission because when they're going around each other, initially they are uh, emitting waves at a low frequency, too low for LIGO to see. As they spiral closer and closer together, then they sweep into our frequency band and we see them uh, for a period that uh, in, with the first signal was only about a tenth of a second, but for others it uh, can be up to a minute uh, if, if the black holes have smaller masses. Uh, but before that, we, we don't see anything. We can't predict. And so we sit there and wait. Uh, yes, there are other things that might produce a signal like that. And so it's absolutely crucial that we have ways of removing fa false signals. And the key to that is we need to see the same kind of a signal in the two or three or four or five detectors of the network. And you need to see it simultaneously to within the uh, signal travel time between the two detectors. And so uh, when a signal is seen, and it is the same signal uh, uh, seen uh, com coming from the same, the same kind of signal, say from two black holes with the same masses, uh, what is done to take, is to take the data then of say two detectors and you slide them in time so those signals don't overlap. And you look to see, do you see any other signals? And uh, you basically do a lot of sliding in time in order to verify that the background noise is not producing any other simultaneous signals. And in order to determine the statistics then, what was the probability 
that the two signals that were simultaneous say to within a tenth of a, to within uh, uh, 10 milliseconds. What is the probability that the, the, that was a real signal? Uh, you study the noise by doing the sliding of the data relative to each other. So that's one of the data analysis techniques. Thank you, sir. Sure, we have a lot of burning questions, but um, all good things have to come to an end. So before we dispense uh, for the evening, let's give a, a, a big hand to everyone.